Tonight, go ahead and go to the book of John. I'm going to begin a uh, series through the Gospel of John. Of course, all the Gospels are good, but I like the Gospel of John because it's kind of the most unique of the four Gospels, I think. There's a lot of stories that are in this Gospel that aren't in the other ones. And so we're going to start off, I'm going to try to get through all of chapter one tonight. I I want to try to do a chapter a week. Some of the chapters are pretty long and there's a lot in them and a lot of stuff I'd like to cover on this message tonight. Don't know if I'll I have time to get to everything I want to get to. But let's go and start reading. In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. I'm going to stop reading right there. And right here, it's very clear in the beginning of this chapter, we see that John, he is, when he's talking about the word, there's no doubt about it. We're going to see he's talking about Jesus Christ. He says it as clear as you can possibly say it. The word was God. Okay. Jesus Christ is God. The title of my message tonight is Jesus Christ, my God and my Messiah. He is both of those things. He is my God. He is my Messiah. I will say that all day long. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they hate John chapter 1. I wish I had time. I thought about going through the Jehovah's Witness Bible on John 1 because they absolutely butcher this because they don't believe that Jesus was God. And they have had to mangle, I mean, just absolutely mangle these scriptures because of the fact that it is so crystal clear that Jesus himself is God. And I like how he says it here in the beginning. He says, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Kind of reminds me of Genesis 1.1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And it's very clear here. He says, you know, all things were made by Him. I think the wording in here is on purpose. It's similar to Genesis 1.1, because He's showing people that, hey, the God that we talked about, that, that talked about in Genesis 1.1 is Jesus Christ. He is that same God. He is not a different God. I heard somebody one, one day say that, you know, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament aren't the same God. I had a guy, when we did the uh, Bible study out at the high rise, came in there one day and he said that. He was like, well, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament aren't the same God. And I was like, what? He was, and he's, like, he's like, yeah, there's no way they're the same. You know, the God of the Old Testament, he's killing everybody. And the God of the New Testament, it's all about love, blah, blah, blah. And, no, they're the same God. Definitely the same God. There is no doubt about it. And the, the Apostle John, his first book, I like to say this book here, it is, it's a revelation of God, you could say. I mean, he is revealing what John is doing. It's revealing some things about God that was not previously known. And obviously, Jesus Christ is what revealed those things when he was on earth. But John, in his writings, he's revealing this to the world. And you could say his last book that he wrote, the book of Revelation, what is it called? It's called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And so you could say that John, it's a revelation of God, something that was not previously known. Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which was, which was God. So you could say, you know, first book was a revelation that Jesus Christ was God. And then you could say, you know, that Revelation, well, look at, look at what he says in Revelation uh, chapter 1. Verse 1, so John, it's a revelation that Jesus is God. And then Revelation chapter 1, and verse 1, I won't quote it right if I say it, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So right there, you know, he's revealing things about God that was not previously known. And so, you know, it's very clear. I think it's very interesting uh, it, it's the, it's very clear. John was revealing that Jesus Christ was the God of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it's interesting too because when you're reading Genesis chapter one, you might notice in verse 26. Okay, in the beginning, it's just it's just God. Okay, man has not been made yet. But look what he says in verse 26. It says, and God said, let us. Make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Right there we see God, he's talking kind of in plural form here. He's saying, let us make man in our own image. What's that talking about? Well, I believe it's all the Godhead here talking. You've got God the Father, God the Son, 
God the Holy Spirit. And once again, when we start getting into things with the Trinity, it is a little much for our minds to comprehend sometimes, isn't it? And you know, you got to be careful. Sometimes people get really wacky with some things involving the Trinity. And it's always best when it comes to these things is to go off of clear scriptures. And it doesn't get any clearer than some of these ones we're reading here in John 1, and that is that Jesus is God. Jesus said also in John, I and my Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Anybody who tries to say that Jesus is not God, run from that person. All right? And they will. They'll try to get real intelligent on you, and they'll get real confusing on the Trinity. But listen, Jesus is God. It's that simple. The, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have no idea what they're talking about. And that's why they've got to just mangle this chapter because it is it is so crystal clear. And notice too, John is making it clear in this passage that Jesus Christ it was the source of life. He said in verse 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And in Genesis 2, 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It was God that breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. It was God that gave man a living soul. And here in John, he's saying the word, who is Jesus Christ, he was the source of life. I mean, it's, it doesn't get any more clear that Jesus is, in fact, God. It's crystal clear also that God came to, it was God that came to earth, and God came to earth for all men. Verse 5, and, that, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. All men through him might believe. But he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Now, this verse right here, this is another one that gets butchered. Well, this is Jesus. He was coming for the Jews and his own received him not speaking specifically about the Jews. But wait a minute. Jesus did not come to earth just for the Jews. What it, look at what it says in Romans three. Well, you don't have to turn around. Just read it. Romans three twenty nine says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. People, they take this verse here in John and they try to make it like, you no, know, Jesus came for the Jews, but the Jews rejected him, and then God had to go, ended up going to the Gentiles instead. But no, he came unto his own, that's the Jews, no. Who is the source of life? God, right? Was he the source of life just for the Jews, or was he the source of life for the Gentiles too? Are not all people his creation? Okay, all are his creation. God is the one who created man, and it was... You know, not all men rejected him. Because notice what it says in the next verse. He came to his own, his own received or not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. Now, who does that include? Is that just Jews? That's Jews and Gentiles, isn't it? And it's revealed in the New Testament. You know, there's no difference. But once again, people do. They, they, they absolutely butcher that verse. And they make it like, no, Jesus was coming for the Jews. And, you know... Everybody know, you know, most of you know about the famous anti-Anderson conference that happened recently. And, and y'all know I was there and, and I, I'm embarrassed that I was there. And a lot of people wonder like, why were you there? I had real good reasons for being there. All right. I, I had good reason for being there. People that love me and care about me wanted me to go. And they wanted to see if Sam Gipp could straighten me out and failed miserably. All right. But, but I, I went there out of respect for these people. And I heard some of the craziest things I've ever heard in my life. And one, he, I actually wasn't there. He did it on Sunday night when he tells, he tells the story in there about, you know, he's kind of given a parable about Jesus right before he comes to earth. And he makes it out in the story like Jesus, the moment he came to earth was the moment he was born. Okay. Not the moment he was conceived. The moment he was born, and he's telling this stupid story in there about, you know, these angels, they're wondering what's going on. And, you know, they're like, you know, Jesus, what are you going to do if the Jews won't receive you? Oh, I'm going to have to think about that one. You know, I mean, just a stupid parable. And then, you know, making it like, you know, that's why he went to the Gentiles, because he came into his own and his own received him not. And that was just stupid. And first of all, this is just a side note, but I believe when God came to earth, 
I believe God came to earth at the moment of conception. There's no doubt about that in my mind. We don't read about it here in the book of John, but we're going to read about John. And what did John do when he was in the womb of his mother and she came into the presence of Mary, who had God in her womb? He leaped with joy, didn't he? John the Baptist, who was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, knew that God was in Mary. And Elizabeth, who was got filled with the Holy Ghost and knew what was going on. You know why? Because God did not come to earth on December 25th, year zero. I know he wasn't born December 25th. But he came to earth at the moment of conception. And you know what? It's like, oh, he was just making a story. Yeah, but you know why he would think that way? Because these crazy Ruckmanites, they don't believe that... You're, you know, Peter Ruckman, he taught that you're not a soul until you take that first breath. And that's just ridiculous. And it sounds like just a good excuse for abortion, if you ask me. But we believe life begins at conception. And I believe God came to earth at the moment of conception. And he and I, since I was a little kid, I understood this. I, I, I was, you know, I, and I remember thinking, I remember thinking about this as a little kid. What must have been like for God to be in the womb of, you know, for nine months? And obviously... You know, that's one of these things we can't comprehend, I, you know, but at the same time, I, I remember thinking about that as a little kid because I'm like, he was in her womb for nine months. You know, it, what was it like for God being a little baby? I remember thinking about those things as a little kid, but guys like Sam Gipp, they have problems with kids and, you know, kids who figure things out at 12 years old. He likes to bash people for that. But let me tell you something. You know what? He, he's always making fun of people who figure out things at 12 years old. Well, I figured out how to get saved at five years old. Amen. And, you know, there's a lot of things you can figure out at a young age. And I'm telling you, I, I hate, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't know why he tries to use that. It's like you got to be old and educated and have all these degrees from some crazy institute down in Pensacola. Not the one you're from, <laughs> but the other one down there. And I'm telling you, it's a, it's a joke and it's ridiculous. But it's crystal clear God came to earth for all men. But did all men receive him? No. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Our spiritual birth has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with works. It has only to, what it has to do with is the will of God. All right. So what is, the, you know, it's only those who God has chosen to be saved, right? Well, Yes. But who has God chosen to be saved? Oh, only God in his infinite wisdom knows who the chosen people are. Well, no, actually, you know, in verse uh, 12, or we read that verse, verse 13, it says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. Okay, not, not born of blood. You know, it doesn't matter what bloodline they come from, anything like that. It doesn't matter if they're a Jew. It doesn't matter anything like that. Or the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, so right there, it makes it very clear that those who get saved are those who are born of the will of God. Well, what was God's will? That those who believe would be saved. Whoever believes will be saved. That's what God chose. It wasn't God randomly picking people according to his divine will. God chose that believers would be saved and unbelievers would not be saved. And that the believers who are saved has nothing to do with works. Absolutely nothing. Those who believe go to heaven. Those who don't do not go to heaven. Works has nothing to do with it. Bloodline has nothing to do with it. Your will, my will has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with God's will. And it was God's will that those who believe would be saved. It's that simple. All right? It's so simple, a five-year-old can understand it. All right? And I, and I thank God I got it at five years old. All right? Would you get your theology from a five-year-old? Well, if it lines up with the Bible... <laughs> You know, and I had to figure out how to get saved. Five years old. And you know what? I'm not going to let anybody despise that or make fun of that. I don't care. In fact, if these guys aren't going to come as a little child, they're not going to get saved. You have to come as a child. It's, it's that simple, folks. Everybody wants to complicate everything, especially salvation. And it's a joke. But look, verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Right here, it leaves no doubt that this is clearly talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word 
became flesh and dwelt among us. That is talking about God. The, I said the Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, I do know what they do with this. They just mangle the scripture on it. They just absolutely mangle it. It's painful to read it. It's so blatantly obvious that they're trying to twist things because they don't like what it says. But Jesus Christ, he was God. Jesus Christ is God. And so verse 15 says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, what's interesting about that, John said, the one that's coming after me is preferred before me because he was before me. But wait a minute, what do we know about the birth of John and Jesus? John was born before Jesus, wasn't he? John was born six months before Jesus was born. But John said, that one coming after me was before me. Why is he saying that? Well, because Jesus is eternal. Okay? Jesus, like God, has no beginning and he has no end. And it didn't matter that Jesus was born after John because he has always been. Jesus Christ is the I, he is the I am. Jesus Christ is, and we're, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but all those times when you see God in the Old Testament, it was actually Jesus Christ. Okay? We didn't call him that because he was not revealed at that time. It refers to him as God, but yet it was Jesus Christ in the flesh. And so he was, he was, he was before John. And it says um, in verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received in grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Notice the law is what killed us, but Jesus Christ is what gave us life. Romans chapter 7, verse 9 says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died, and the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Okay, what's he saying? You know, that law, it killed us. It's what sin is the reason we die. We're going to die one of these days because we're sinners. And that law is what showed us we're sinners. We've transgressed that law. And because of that, we deserve to die and go to hell. But yet we don't have to. Why? Because Jesus Christ came to this earth. God came to this earth. He is the source of life. And we can have eternal life through him if we will believe on his name. So verse 18, it says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So wait a minute, what's going on here? Right here it says, no man has seen God at any time. But right, but it says, uh, you know, this only begotten Son, you know, he hath declared him. He's told him about us. But wait a minute, what about all those Old Testament passages where people saw God? Where Moses spoke face to face as a man speaks to a man. You know, all those times where people saw God, Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the garden before they fell. Who was that? It was Jesus. It was Jesus Christ. We see other places in the Bible where if we were to see God in all his glory, okay, and the Bible teaches too that God is a spirit, you know, that, that would kill us to see that. But yet we see that throughout the Old Testament, there were appearances of God, but it was actually Jesus Christ who is God. And once again, you're gonna, we can get into stuff and we can like explode our brains if we're not careful. But you know, the truth is, if, if we could fully comprehend God, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? And that's why we just got to take the Bible for what it says. And sometimes you just guys like, I don't understand it all, but I believe it. <laughs> and that, I think that's okay. And that's what you have, that's what you have to do. But I, but Hebrews 1, 1 says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. God spoke in different ways throughout time. God revealed different things throughout time. And throughout time, more and more has been revealed about God. And of course, during the time of Christ, much more was revealed about God. You know, the Son of God has been revealed in a way that you know, people hadn't known before. And you know what? One of these days, we're going to learn more about God. One of these days, we're going to see His face. There's another verse that says, One day we will know Him as we are known of Him. Something along those lines. I mean, we're going to learn more about God in the ages to come because He is. He's, he's, he's an infinite God. But I believe that the God that everyone saw in the Old Testament 
It was Jesus Christ. And it's interesting too, I'm not talking about, I don't want to talk about Jehovah's Witnesses a whole lot tonight, but in the Old Testament, if you look in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, many of those encounters that man had with God, it refers to them as Jehovah. But then in John chapter 1 in their own Bible, it says no man has seen God at any time. So wait a minute, so then who were those people seeing back in the Old Testament? It was Jesus, but they can't admit that because they name him Jehovah in, in their Bible, and Jesus isn't Jehovah. And, and I tell you, they'll fight you over that stuff. My dad put it on a sign at their church years ago, something like Jesus is Jehovah or something like that, and boy, he had Jehovah's Witnesses calling. They were mad, and it was, it was pretty funny. And my dad didn't care. <laughs> He's never been a big fan of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I've always agreed with him on that. But anyway, Jesus, though, he did. He revealed things about God to man. He declared the Father. He declared God. He taught them new things about God that they had not understood in the past. Jesus revealed those things. So verse 19, and we see that John the Baptist, he was sent to prepare the Jews to receive Christ, says, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. They said unto him, Who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the, of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were the, of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it. I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth Abara beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And if you, what, what's going on here, you've got these Pharisees, they can tell something's up, something's going on. Okay, John is baptizing people. And, you know, there's differences of ideas and a lot of the commentaries on, on what that meant. Some people teach that there was baptisms that they did in the Old Testament. I don't believe there was. I think the reason they're asking, you know, they, they were confused that he's baptizing because it's clear to, to me that he's ushering in a new era by his preaching, by what he was doing. And that baptism clearly appeared to be making people a part of a separate group. Okay, And are we not today as believers, as a church, we're a, we're a separate group, aren't we? We are a congregation of believers and we baptize, don't we? And we are separate from the world and everything else. But their, what was confusing them, you know, their prophecy... Their understanding of prophecy was off, causing them confusion. You know, they're thinking, you know, where's Elias? You know, Elijah's got to come first. Are you that prophet? Are you the Messiah? They were confused. They didn't understand what was going on. And they see him doing this baptizing. It's very clear that something is about to change, but it wasn't changing the way they thought. They didn't necessarily like the message of John. We don't see it here, but it's very clear in the other Gospels, one of the reasons they didn't like John, he called them things like, you know, vipers. And, you know, he, he called them names. He called them out for their sin. You know, he called them out for thinking they were special because they had Abraham as their father. I mean, he did. He, this guy, he told the truth. I mean, he preached the way Baptists are supposed to preach. He didn't care. He's, he just let it rip. He didn't, it didn't matter if he was before the king. He called the king out for having his brother's wife. So what happened as a result of that? He got his head cut off. Well, that's not a very good outcome. Yeah, but you know what else he got? He got probably the best compliment you could ever get from Jesus Christ. Said that there was no other man born of women better than John the Baptist. I think we all should be fine with getting our head cut off if we can get that kind of compliment from Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist, there, there, there was none better than him other than Jesus Christ. 
And so, you know, he was, he was, he was, he was successful, but yet they didn't, they didn't receive him. They didn't like his message. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, but it's very possible. I believe that John the Baptist and Jesus, their only encounter, even though they're related, Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. So I guess to make them third cousins, uh, I believe. And so I, I believe their only other encounter was in their mother's wombs. We see there, um, in Luke 1, 41, and it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped within my womb for joy. It's very clear that you know something special was going on here, and I believe this was the only encounter that they had in their lifetime until this moment. Because uh, John the Baptist, he did not know who the Messiah was. Let's read a couple more verses. Um, where do we leave off? We left in 31. So verse 32, it says, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare record, that this is the Son of God. So right there, we see that it was clear that John, he knew, he understood that the one who was the Messiah was going to be the one that he saw the Spirit of God descending on. And so I don't believe he knew before this point, I, I, I could be wrong on that, that it was going to be Jesus. I don't know if they had had any encounters before, but it's just neat because... Here, he's been talking about the day before. One's coming after me. All of a sudden, Jesus Christ shows up and he immediately knows who it is. Behold the Lamb of God which take, take away the sin of the world. How did he know? The Spirit hadn't descended on him yet. But I believe the same feeling that came over him when he was in his mother's womb came over him again when he was in the presence of Jesus on that day. And what an exciting time that must have been. This is what he's been preaching about. This is what he's been waiting for. And sure, and you know the story, Jesus came to be baptized of him. He's like, I need to be baptized of thee. But Jesus, uh, he had him baptized and he was baptized. The Holy Ghost ascended down like a dove. And you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost all kind of there at the same time. You got the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. You got Jesus there in the water. You have a voice from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I mean, just what a moment that must have been right there. You know, it's clear there's a lot of people around. You, you know, when you look at these things in the Bible, it's like how in the world were there only 120 people you know, with Jesus after his resurrection? I mean... Because them Jews were hard. Boy, they were hard-hearted. It's incredible that after that, you would think everybody there would have stayed with Jesus the whole time. But you know what? John the Baptist, he's, uh, he is, he's an amazing character because I think he's a great example of humility. He was one who was only interested in the will of God. Okay, look what it says in verse 35. It says, The next day after John stood and two of his disciples... And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two, which I heard John speak and followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So right here, Andrew, we see, was one of John the Baptist's disciples. And I could be wrong on this too. I, I believe the other one was John, the one who wrote this book. I, 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 could, be, I could be wrong on that too. Uh, I'm not for sure on that. But it's, 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 to me, it's interesting because some of John's very own close disciples ended up becoming followers of Jesus instead. Meaning they're not following John the Baptist anymore. And remember when the people came to John, it's like, hey, you know, everybody's following Jesus. Not as many people are following you anymore. And what did John say? Hey, he must increase, I must decrease. Well, that's not the attitude of the Baptist today, is it? You know, we can't stand it if we lose any of our followers and they go follow somebody else. You know, our, the Baptist philosophy today is, I must increase, I must increase. <laughs> I mean, that... You know, decrease isn't in their vocabulary. And a completely opposite of John the Baptist and the attitude that he had. He was just interested in the will of God. 
He was not the bridegroom. He was the friend of the bridegroom. And his joy was full. The fact that people were following Christ, he's like, hey, my, my job's done. And he was, he was thrilled about it. Boy, if God's people just have that attitude. If we wouldn't get so stuck on ourselves and we could just be thrilled when God's will is done, whether it benefits us or doesn't benefit us, what a wonderful thing that would be. But he didn't mind when his disciples followed Jesus instead. So, um, you know, his disciples for sure, Andrew, the other one might have been John. But then look at what it says in verse 41. It says, He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. All right, now I have to talk about this. We have found Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. Okay? Now, what is that saying? The term Messiah or Messiah is interpreted the Christ. Okay? If it's an interpretation of a word, it means, it means the same thing, right? Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. It, it's very clear right there. Well, you know, Sam Gipp, one of the things that he's well known for is his, you know what I never called Jesus? I never call him my Messiah. Are you a Jew? You know, the Gentiles were never promised a Messiah. And I'm going to show you just how wacko and wicked and just how flat out wrong that statement is. That Jesus is not my Messiah. Okay? And once again, I know he's got a problem with kids. But my seven-year-old daughter, Allie, she heard that statement. She's like, what? She's like, why would he say Jesus is his Messiah? Isn't he? He's the preacher. He's supposed to know the Bible. Jesus is his Messiah. You know, I mean, Allie understood that. She's only seven years old. We can't listen to her. We're not supposed to listen to kids, even if what they say lines with the Bible. But he, he's, I mean, he flat out said that. And listen, once again, I had good reason. All right? I'm still embarrassed. I was, I was at the famous Anti Anderson conference, and I watched him two times give an explanation of that because he says he was taken out of context. But he got up there, and he's writing this stuff down on a whiteboard, okay? This isn't slip of the tongue or anything like that. He explained what he meant when he said that Jesus is not his Messiah. And he, and he said this, and you can, go, you can go watch this stuff online and see, but he said you know, that the term Messiah means Christ, but Messiah has a broader definition, Okay, now, I tried to find where he gets this definition. Okay, I looked in the Bible. It says Messiah is interpreted Christ. Okay, to me, that should be all we need right there. All right, but you know, let's let's help him out a little bit. If you go to the Strong's Concordance and you look up the term Messiah in the Hebrew, it means anointed, usually a consecrated person, the Messiah. Okay. The, the anointed Messiah, uh, and then in the Greek, Messiah means Christ. In the Greek, Christ means anointed or Messiah. I mean, basically the same thing the Bible says. Okay, the Strong's actually lines up with what the Bible says about the definition. If the Webster's 1828 dictionary, another dictionary that Baptists like to use, I like to use it. The term Messiah, if you look it up, means anointed or Christ, the anointed, the Savior of the world. That lines up with what the Bible says. Well, he said it has a broader definition. I can't figure out where he gets this definition from, but he said it actually means deliverer. Okay? And the Jews were promised a deliverer, but the Gentiles were never promised a deliverer. So, you know, and, you know, he, he said, you know, he said God never promised to deliver to the Gentiles because who would the Gentiles need to be delivered from? The Jews need to deliver because they need to be delivered from the Gentiles. But you know what's stupid about that saying is the Gentiles never needed to deliver. Well, who was it that was persecuting the early church? It was the Jews, wasn't it? It was the Jews that persecuted the early church. It was the Jews that persecuted Christians. So you could say it was Gentiles that needed to deliver. But listen, let's just go ahead and give that to them. Let's just say that that's true. Okay, it has a broader definition. And Messiah means deliver and Christ does not mean deliver. All right, let's just give him that. And so what he'll, what he'll do, he'll uh, use Romans eleven twenty seven or verse 26. Okay, and I showed you all a few weeks ago in my message, the fullness of the Gentiles, that all of Romans chapter 11 has been fulfilled. 
There is nothing future in Romans chapter 11. And it says, And so all Israel shall be saved. It is written, There shall come out a sign, The deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. What does it say he's going to turn away from Jacob? Ungodliness, or he's going to turn Gentiles away from Jacob? What did he say he was going to turn, deliver Jacob from? Ungodliness. That's what it said. Not Gentiles. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Okay? They were promised a deliverer in the book of Isaiah to deliver them from ungodliness, to be delivered from their sins. They try to say, this hasn't happened yet. Has Israel been delivered yet? They're surrounded by Gentiles. You know, they got all kinds of problems right now. They haven't been delivered yet. Yes, they have. They've been delivered from ungodliness and their sins when they receive Christ as their Savior. And so all Israel shall be saved. What's it talking about? Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans chapter 11, he's showing, you know, hath God cast away Israel? He's saying, hey, they can be saved too. All Israel shall be saved. If they will call on the Lord for salvation, they will be saved. And they were, because they were promised a deliverer. And Jesus Christ, he turned ungodliness from Jacob. And he turned, he did that when he died on the cross and he paid for their sins. That was, that was how he took away their sins. He took away their sins when he died on the cross. We said, but wait a minute. Then wouldn't that mean all Israel is saved or all Israel is going to go to heaven? Yes. But here's the thing. What does it teach in Romans chapter 9? They are not all Israel that are of Israel. Turns out, those who get their sins paid for, those who get cleansed, those who get delivered, are those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are Israel. They are the seed of Abraham. It's not a physical bloodline. Okay? It's not people born of blood, okay? or of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. It, believers, those who get deliverance, are those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and he says, we were never promised a deliverer. Well, you know what's interesting about that? Because he gets mad when people say, well, if Jesus isn't Messiah, he isn't saved. Well, guess what? If Jesus isn't your deliverer, you're not saved either. Isaiah 59, verse 20, this is the passage that Romans is quoting. In Romans chapter 11, it's quoting Isaiah 59, verse 20, and it says, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression... In Jacob, saith the Lord. Notice it doesn't use the term deliverer there. It uses the term redeemer. So if Jesus isn't his deliverer, is Jesus not his redeemer? I hope he doesn't sing redeemed how I love to proclaim it with everybody else in church. And all those songs, we, we sing about being redeemed all the time. We've been redeemed. Why? Because Jesus Christ, he paid for our sins. And we are, we are a redeemed people. And you, it's clear you know, let's just give him that. He's right. Messiah means deliverer, but it's clear from scriptures, deliverer and redeemer are the same thing. So if Jesus isn't your Messiah or deliverer, then he's not your redeemer either. And you know what we call that when people say things like that? That is what we call a gaff. All right. When you say things like that, that is what is known as a gaff. And a gaff is what we call a social blunder. Or a faux pas, something that you're just not supposed to say in certain situations. And you know what? When you're around Christians, it's a bad thing to say Jesus isn't your Messiah or Jesus isn't your deliverer or redeemer. You know why? Because everybody's going to think you're not saved. But it's not just a gaffe. It's what they call a political gaffe. I heard somebody explain this one time. A political gaffe is when a politician accidentally tells the truth that they don't want people to know. Okay, we've seen that many times before. Remember when Obama was running for president the first time and he's talking to Joe the plumber and he's made that comment about spreading the wealth? Okay, now everybody knows that Obama believes in spreading the wealth, but that's not something you're supposed to say to the American people. They don't like hearing that. Okay, American people, they like when politicians tell them what they want to hear and spreading the wealth is something that people don't want to hear. But everybody knows it's what he believes, but he's not allowed to admit that. And when Sam Gipp is saying that Jesus isn't, isn't his Messiah and isn't his deliverer or redeemer, Sam Gipp, what he is saying is, I'm not saved, but he's, you're not supposed to say that. 
when you're around God's people. But sometimes these guys accidentally tell a truth that they don't want people to know. And, you know, when I first heard him say that, you know, he misspoke. He was just copying off of John Hagee. He trusts John Hagee and, you know, got caught up in this. And, you know, he's just too proud to admit it. But boy, when I heard him up there explaining that, and, you know, I, I shouldn't share too much of this. Um, I, but I asked him about it. And he got pretty mad when I questioned his salvation. And, you know, do you still think I don't think Jesus is the Messiah after that explanation I did? And I'm like, not really. <laughs> I, was like, I, I said, it's pretty clear in the Bible. Christ, Messiah, the same thing. That deliverer thing didn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, and he didn't even try to tell me where he got that definition from. I, have, I can't. I'm, if you can figure out where that definition comes from, you know, I'd love to find out. I'm still not going to believe it because the Bible says Messiah is interpreted the Christ. But I'm telling you, it, it's, it's, it's ridiculous that we have gotten to the point where somebody can say something like that in a Baptist church, in a Baptist college. They can say it more than one time, and Baptists can't figure out, if, you know, they're, they're still questioning whether or not they should throw them under the bus. Or reject that guy. That's that is ridiculous. Listen, it's rare that I call anybody's name out. It's rare you're going to hear me some, calling somebody a false prophet. I think that's a dangerous thing to go calling, falsely accusing somebody of being a false prophet. But when you're saying things like that, I mean, when you're making up these stupid stories about Jesus not actually coming to Earth until the moment of birth, you know, when you're saying things like I talked about the other day, where you know Jesus wasn't supposed to be named Jesus. That his parents disobeyed God and named him Jesus instead of Emmanuel. When you can say things like that, when you're saying things like that, I'm sorry. You're either a false prophet or you are just dumber than a box of rocks. I mean, you ain't got the brains of a blind goose in a hailstorm. I'm telling you, yeah, nobody should ever get away with saying anything like that. And I'm telling you, a guy like that ought to be run out of every decent fundamental Baptist church. In America, but let me tell you, people are so connected politically, it's all about the politics anymore. And it's just like Donald Trump. When Donald Trump said, I could go out and shoot somebody and people would still vote for me, he wasn't lying when he said that. Because that's how people are politically. And you know what? In ba many Baptist churches, in many Baptist circles, if you're in the network, if you're connected like you're supposed to be, you can get up and you can say, Jesus isn't your Messiah and you won't get run out of Baptist church. He said that a couple years ago. And they get run off. He's, you can get up and you can say that Jesus wasn't supposed to be called Jesus and you won't get ran out of a church. What is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. People are just clueless. People are afraid to take stands on anything. And he says that since he did all this, he hasn't lost any meetings. And let me tell you something. If that is true, what a crying shame. I mean, what a crying shame for that, if, if that is true, that people haven't got the guts to call him up and say, sorry, come see me after you get saved. I'm, t I'm sorry. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a harsh accusation. I'm sorry. But the Bible says, you know, who is Antichrist? But he that denied that Jesus is a Christ. Well, he didn't say Christ. He said Messiah. Same thing. The Bible proves the same thing. And so, I'm sorry, I am allowed to reject somebody like that, and I don't have to be nice about it, and don't, and, I mean, I, I better not hear anything about this. Not until, uh, you know, not until he does a, either, not, not clarifies, he's already tried to clarify this. Not until he repents of that, or gets saved, whatever, whatever needs to be done, that is absolutely wicked, and I'm not afraid to call it out. Verse, uh, look at verse 41, or verse 42. It says, And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation, a stone. And the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. And Philip was a Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Uh, and Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael come unto him and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. 
Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Right here, Jesus, we see him calling his disciples. And he's basically telling them here in this statement in kind of a fancy way. And I'll give you my theory on what he's talking about here. And I could be dead wrong on this too. But I think he's telling them, y'all are about to go on for the ride of a lifetime. No, let's read, read that verse. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say to you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, you know that, that is kind of a strange thing that was said there. But can anybody think of something in the Bible? I don't know, this is just my theory of what Jesus was saying right then. Because I can't think of any passages in the New Testament where they saw angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, I can't, I, I can't think of anything. I could be wrong. But what's that? Exactly. The old, and, but in the Old Testament... Look what it says in Genesis chapter, uh, lost my spot, 28. Yeah, Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. And it says, And he dreamed a dream, and behold, a ladder set up upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Okay? Now that sounds similar. We see angels going up and down this ladder. And then in verse 17... It says, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Okay, That's what he called that place in Bethel, where he saw the angels ascending and descending on that ladder. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe what Jesus was saying to Nathaniel, this was his way of telling him that this one who came out of Nazareth, okay, because the, the Jews had all kinds of prejudices, didn't they? I mean, boy, they hated Samaritans, and here they find out, you know, he, he, hey, he comes from Nazareth, and he's like, you know, can anything good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, they did. They had a lot of, lot of prejudice. Okay, it was something they dealt with. And then Jesus, you know, he, as soon as he Nathaniel meets him, he says something to him that made it clear, hey, there's something special about this guy. But then Jesus makes that statement to him, and I think this was his way of telling him that this one who came out of Nazareth, Nazareth, was going to be the very door of heaven. Okay, what did what did Jacob call that place where the angels were ascending and descending? He called it the gate of heaven. All right, and here in John in John chapter ten, verse seven, Jesus uh, then said Jesus unto them again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So right there we see Jesus. He refers to himself as the door, and then verse nine says. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So I don't know. Maybe that was just Jesus' way of telling him, I'm the door of heaven. And you're going to see that. You're going to figure that out. And, and Nathaniel did. I don't, I don't know for sure that that's what that means. But it is, it is clear, though, he called his disciples. And I've talked about this before. They didn't understand everything that they were in for following Jesus. If Jesus would have told them everything right then, they all probably would have went right back to fishing and tax collecting and being a physician and all that. Or, uh, that was Luke. I guess he wasn't a disciple. All the other things that they did. But you know what? Truth is, they followed Jesus. It changed them. And every one of these guys, you know, they, they lived great lives for Christ after the resurrection. They did great things for God. It, uh, I mean, what an, what an adventure it must have been for them. But I tell you, John chapter 1, it is very clear. It, John is showing us that this Jesus Christ that he's writing about was clearly God, was clearly the Messiah. And I'm here today, and I will unashamedly say to all Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus Christ is my God. I will say to all Muslims and all those of all other religions that worship God, Jesus Christ is my God. I will say 
to Sam Gip. Jesus Christ is my Messiah. My Messiah. Mine personally. My deliverer. My redeemer. He turned ungodliness away from me. No, that was to Israel. He promised it to Israel. You know, it is, it's true. It was Israel that was promised a deliverer. It was Israel that was promised a Messiah. But guess who Israel is? It's those who are of faith like Abraham. And when you believed on Christ, when you got saved, you became Israel. And guess what? Your ungodliness got turned away from you. You got delivered from your sins. It's clear in the Old Testament, these guys, they looked at a lot of these things and they saw it as physical deliverance. They saw this earthly kingdom that was, that was going to come. There was a lot of spiritual things that they clearly missed, but Jesus revealed those things in the New Testament to us. And I, I think the biggest problem with a lot of these preachers like that is they just don't read the New Testament. They, they, they don't read the New Testament. I heard Sam Gipp one time talking about Stephen Anderson. He's like, he's like, I don't even know if Stephen Anderson knows there is an Old Testament. He needs to read the Old Testament. I'm thinking, do you even know there's a New Testament? Read the New Testament. It's so clear. It shows us who Jesus is. He is God. He is the Messiah. And He is my God. And He is my Messiah. And I hope you can say the same thing. So with that, let's all stand together.